yeah, so I'm gonna talk about a project. Uh, this is a SIDAC project that was started kind of after most of, the, of this round of SIDACs um, to develop a terrestrial dynamical core for E3SM. Um, we're particularly interested in modeling the water cycle. And <clears throat> so in the current models, the subsurface flow is basically 1D. So you have separate columns, but water doesn't flow across between those columns. And we are interested in extending this to a global 3D model. So there are lots of processes going along, um, interaction with root systems, surface runoff flow, but it, the big thing that we want to add is the horizontal subsurface flow. And so this is going to require solving porous media uh, sorts of equations at global scale. This means um, we are going to end up with, uh, with distorted grids for a handful of reasons. This is a kind of new requirement, so a lot of uh, models to date use, say, finite volume methods with two-point fluxes. And that's not going to do it for us. So this project, the kind of core, is solving uh, variably saturated Richards equation with uh, a thermal hydrology mode. Um, and this is going to include permafrost. We want it to be portable, extensible, fun for people to experiment with. Um, it needs to be accurate on distorted grids, so a part of the talk here, we're going to uh, look at discretizations that are appropriate for that kind of purpose. Um, we need to be able to handle high contrast anisotropic coefficients. Um, we'd like to do this in a way that doesn't require numerical hacks, um, which are kind of common in, uh, in most subsur subsurface flow modeling uh, right now. Um, we want to be able to do time accurate analyses, quasi steady analyses, so that we can do uh, spin up procedures very quickly. Um, there are relatively long time scales in, um, say, in aquifers that we would like to be able to uh, spin up quickly. We want to add some data assimilation parameter estimation capabilities. If you were building a new model, we want to be able to include uh, components like that. And the verification and validation process is something that we want to be uh, automated and where we can kind of distinguish the components and look at convergence rates and things like that um, independently. So as a simplified model here, um, it, enough to uh, understand the discretization requirements um, and it, a little bit easier to look at the equations, um, we're looking at Darcy flow. So the strong form of Darcy flow, we have something that says divergence of the uh, flux is equal to any source term, and then there's the uh, Darcy relation that the flux is going to be proportional to the uh, gradient of the pressure. And the kappa here is a conductivity coefficient, and it can be tensor valued, it can be spatially variable, it can be very high contrast, um, you know, up to about 10 orders of magnitude um, contrast from element to element. And so there's a couple of approaches that are uh, kind of usable for this purpose. So it, there are mixed finite element methods. These uh, kind of the classical method here that's of interest on the sorts of grids that we're looking at are, is uh, BDM1, um, Bretzi, Douglas, Marini. There is a variant of that formulation called wheeler yotov And there's a new discretization um, in, uh, called, uh, from Arbogast and Correa, um, published in 2016. And it's kind of wild because like, this is variable coefficient Poisson problem, right? This is like the classic problem that's been studied for many, many decades. And yet this Arbogast and Correa result is actually significant new work as recently as 2016. And uh, there's actually been some uh, follow on to that work. Um, a variant of this is to look at uh, multipoint flux finite volume methods. They actually coincide in a lot of ways, and we'll see an example of how they coincide um, with, uh, say, this wheeler yotov variant. So the way that mixed finite element work, methods work is you have a velocity space. The velocity space is supposed to um, discretize 
the uh, is supposed to describe H div, which is a space of functions in which their divergence is integrable. And we're interested in lowest order methods because we don't ever expect to have a potential for higher order coefficient, uh, higher order convergence. Um, these sort of problems, uh, due to the variation in uh, coefficients from element to element, you just don't have smooth solutions. You have rather rough solutions. Um, and so higher order methods would actually tend to hurt you in terms of stability without giving you anything in terms of accuracy. However, we do care quite a bit about the uh, convergence rates of these sort of methods because that actually translates to a meaningful sense of accuracy. So these sort of mixed methods, they have a cell-centered pressure and the BDM1 spaces have velocities that vary linearly along each face. And you represent the normal component along those faces. And when it's mapped over to a physical element, you get, uh, it, it uses a Piola transform. And so these arrows, um, they, they still are uh, normal to the, the face that they come off of. Um, but in general, you're on a non-orthogonal grid. These methods can actually um, give you a convergent discretization that is uh, first or second order convergent even in the, in the velocity, um, depending on how you measure that quantity and some details. When we discretize it, it gives us a saddle point problem. And if you work with solvers, you're like, oh no, a saddle point problem. <clears throat> so saddle point problems, Yes, we know how to solve them as, as a matter of theory, but as a matter of practice, if you take a given number of elements and you compare a um, positive definite formulation with a saddle point problem, probably the saddle point problem is going to be quite a bit more expensive to solve. And that's because there's a lot of technicalities in how to, um, how to actually deal with that. So, there is a class of methods. Um, these are pretty popular. They've been developed over the last 15 years or so um, called BDDC. These are, uh, stands for Balancing Domain Decomposition by Constraints. Um, they're pretty neat in that you can have an a priori convergence rate. So independent of the contrasting coefficients, stretched elements, um, tensor valued coefficients that are highly anisotropic, um, any grid alignment or no alignment with the grid, you can say a priori, I'm going to have a condition number that's less than 10 or whatever you choose. And the method can automatically um, enrich as necessary so that you get a preconditioner that um, delivers that condition number that you want. The problem is it doesn't actually guarantee the grid complexity. So there are cases we can come up with some counterexamples where um, the cost goes up quite a lot. The preconditioner does make the, that system converge very fast. The condition number indeed is less than the, the bound that you uh, prescribed, but it, they can be quite expensive. They allow you to coarsen very rapidly. So this figure here, it's looking at condition number versus the coarsening rate. And so we're coarsening by, say, um, 15 element by 15 element patches down to one degree of freedom effectively on the coarse grid. Um, and they're delivering condition numbers that are like five or seven. So this is a really cool feature. It's unique to BDDC and related methods. It's not directly available in, in other classes of methods. And the ingredients to solve these sort of problems is to be able to solve subdomain problems with um, kind of an almost Neumann system. So it's like Neumann boundary conditions, except for a few degrees of freedom or perhaps an integral constraint. Um, it's a little bit hard to see here, but it, here the corners and the averages are all stapled down. Those are all zero. And the average on this space is one. And so you, you solve problems that are of that variant. Um, it brings you to a coarse space. On the coarse space, you might use something like algebraic multigrid, or you can continue to recursively apply these sort of methods. Um, oh, this worked wonderfully before. Um, supposed to be a video of flow and fractured media that some colleagues of ours 
um, that work on these BDDC methods using the implementations in PETSI have done. Um, so there is another approach. If we want to use uh, kind of more standard multigrid methods, something that's a little bit lighter weight. So the setup cost is reasonably high for BDDC methods. And while they're really robust, they're kind of heavy. They're um, a little bit heavier than we would like um, for most, uh, for, for our purposes. Um, so there are monolithic methods where you course in this mixed formulation. They're pretty complicated. Um, it involves some sort of overlapping smoother updates um, or you know, kind of similar decomposition. Um, so it's, it's not so well suited to uh, vectorization. It's hard to achieve high performance. You can achieve pretty low iteration counts. Um, so theoretically, like for mathematicians, these are pretty nice methods. But it, when you actually run them, and you want to get uh, the you know, fastest method to your target accuracy, they can be, um, usually they're not as attractive. There are also split methods. And sometimes people call these uh, like field split or short complement methods. So the idea there is you take some uh, block diagonal or block triangular form, and somehow you have to estimate this sure complement. So M up here is a mass matrix. The B is like a divergence. This sure complement um, is spectrally like a Laplacian with some sort of variable or tensor valued coefficients. However, it includes the inverse of that mass matrix. And in general, inverse mass matrices are dense. Um, you can approximate that mass matrix using, say, lumping. And it works fabulous if you have um, non-tensor coefficients. But as soon as you have strong anisotropy in the system, those sort of methods become uh, quite poor. So there, there is a challenge of how are we going to solve, how are we going to approximate that sure complement. Um, it's kind of nice in some sense, but challenging in others. Uh, so here's an example of a BDM1 uh, function. This function has a component in it. So there's a basis function that's associated with that vertex. That's the normal component, component going to the right. And there's a normal component going up. And the interesting thing here is these sort of basis functions are all 0 at all the other corners. And so there's an idea here, and it's um, kind of related to the concept of lumping. But it, what if, when we do the volume integrals here to compute the mass matrices, we can choose quadrature points that go at the corners. And if we do that, all we do is couple together the um, velocity basis functions um, that are associated with the same corner. And they're not connected to any of the other degrees of freedom. So this was the idea in Wheeler and Yotov's paper. And the neat thing about this is you basically have a block diagonal mass matrix. You have one block per vertex. You can run on mixed topology meshes. It's a quite a flexible sort of technique. And what you get out is a cell-centered uh, pressure-only discretization. And so you can think of this as a very fancy sort of finite volume method dealing only with pressure that allows you to recover velocities um, in an accurate way. That means you can actually assemble to what we're doing here. We're just assembling the sure complement. Because the mass matrix is block diagonal, now the inverse mass matrix um, is also block diagonal. It's not dense. And so we, we can compute with this pretty well. And so if you have a standard problem, say not deformed, um, just an identity sort of uh, coefficient, then you get out a nice five-point stencil. This is going to agree with you know, basically any of your simple methods. They're going to uh, give you the same kind of structure. Works great for that purpose. If you have a distorted mesh, you get out other um, values in that stencil. So it becomes a kind of full stencil. Of course, we're interested in this in 3D, but it's easier to, to show up here as, as 2D. Um, 
So a uh, similar kind of thing, if I have variable coefficients. So we, here I have a jump in coefficients. These methods automatically handle those jumps and give you a very nice discretization of what you would want to have happen around those jumps. Um, if the jumps line up with cell boundaries, then it, it gives you the full second order accuracy in all of these components. Um, if they don't line up with cell boundaries, then no method is going to give you that, but it does, uh, it does quite well. So if we look at the solvers for this, if our coefficients were diagonal or the mesh was um, kind of not deformed in a, in a nasty way, then we have solvers that behave quite, um, quite nicely. So this is a measure of cost, kind of CPU microseconds per degree of freedom. Um, this is time. The size of the dots are running on successively larger and larger uh, machines. Um, number of processes is going up. If we take general tensor coefficients, these problems are significantly more difficult to solve. Um, we also can't eliminate, these plots are for 3D, but it, we can't eliminate all these um, matrix entries. Whereas, um, so that's here. So if I have something deformed or unaligned tensor coefficients, then I have these full stencils. Um, in 3D, it's a 27-point stencil, and that's required to discretize that sort of problem. And so that's one big part of why these are more expensive. The other is that some of the heuristics in the multigrid are um, not as reliable for diagnosing that sort of anisotropy. Um, so some improvements in our multigrid will be able to bring down, that down a bit, but it will necessarily be more expensive than uh, the simple coefficients. Um, similarly, on the assembly side, this is a bit more expensive for us right now, but it, we are working on applying some techniques from, uh, the, from this other project, Libseed, which Jeremy talked about uh, yesterday. And uh, we will improve the vectorization. It's kind of the, the same kind of process. So, there's this really recent paper that I mentioned. And if we look at the velocities, and we don't do a sort of special cell averaging kind of thing, but we look at the pointwise velocity, because so that's actually important when we're transporting a lot of tracers. We would like to um, have the most accurate method that we can. And BDM1 methods do not actually deliver a second order on uh, distorted meshes for the velocity. If you average appropriately or integrate over elements, you can get that, um, but in general, not. These AC1 methods are um, the same number of degrees of freedom, and that's the new result. There was an earlier um, method from Arnold Balfi and Falk um, that uh, got this order of convergence, but um, they had some extra degrees of freedom that we needed to include. The downside of these is we don't know of a co-located variant. So we don't know a way to do this exact elimination. We could do that sort of thing as part of a preconditioner, but it becomes a more expensive kind of procedure. So question is, should we trade a more expensive solver for some modest improvement in accuracy? Remember, we're not really in the asymptotic regime. We're doing a, a subsurface flow on the globe. Um, it, and coefficients within the Earth are really multi-scale, even a you know very small regional models. But suppose that the AB, uh, the AC method allows us to use a grid that's just a bit a bit coarser to deliver the same accuracy in terms of the velocities. In 3D, this will give us half the degrees of freedom. It also allows us to take a time step that's a little bit longer. And so we, we might be willing to pay quite a, a bit of extra solve cost um, in order to use this marginally more accurate method um, so that we can use a coarser grid. Also, there's a lot of tracers. Um, the chemistry, those sort of um, variables, uh, that scales with number of elements. Um, OK, so we're building all of this using PETSI. Um, it's providing IMEX time integrators. 
So we've been able to reproduce the sorts of split discretizations from uh, PFlowTran and other subsurface simulators um, using the library functions in Petsy, and this has allowed us to extend because um, we have a lot of, uh, of other more interesting methods. We have an um, extensive suite of algebraic solvers and preconditioners. It allows us to, as runtime options, choose appropriate data structures at each scale. We get really powerful runtime composition of those, so we can experiment very quickly. And um, we have GPU and node-aware communication primitives that uh, deliver a lot of um, kind of useful features. Um, so the current state of affairs is the method that you choose is a runtime option. BDM1 currently needs quite a bit more memory. It needs a bit more cost to solve. That's something that we're experimenting with, um, trying to bring these costs down. We are um, working on the vectorized assembly, similar to libseed, adding uh, Python and Julia plugins to make it easier for scientists to experiment with uh, process models. There's a repository. Um, the team, Nathan Collier at Oak Ridge, uh, Gautam Bisht, who uh, just recently moved to uh, PNNL, um, Matt Nepley, Jen Fredericks, and Glenn Hammond at Sandia, and Satish Kara at Lanel, and thanks to uh, DOEBER for the SIDAC. Questions? <coughs> 